you ever see quite a handsome bloke walk into a restaurant or a pub or something? This really ugly woman on his arm. Yeah? You seen that? And, uh, and you think, what's he doing with her? It's usually the other way around. I was going to come to that, <laughs> but thanks for, thanks for pulling that right from under me. I'll try something else. Did you ever see in some social situation, there's, let's say, a lady this time, and she was a really angular, awkward bloke? And you think, why has she got that? What's she doing? Why is she so utterly committed to that person? And isn't it often something quite wonderful about the undeserved and to the outside, or perhaps quite unjustified love and devotion being shown to that ugly or that angular person in that situation? <laughs> it's not though. It's not because that's what you've got in the church. That's what you've got in the church of God. Not ugly wives, that's not what I'm saying. No, no, no. Don't get that one. Don't get that at all. What you've got is Jesus committed to this ugly, angular bride of his, his church. Now that's weird. Isn't it? I'm glad you sort of ready to throw furniture, because that was the idea, <laughs> <laughs> that was the idea, because it is just odd that Christ should be so committed to, so, you know, such an ugly prospect as his church, and such angular people as what he's got for a bride. There's something marvellous about that. And yet... Although it is amazing grace that drives his continued, his steadfast love for his bride of a certain character, yet that certain character of his church, it no, by no means diminishes Christ's love and commitment to his bride, but it alienates an awful lot of guests who might otherwise be very willing to come to their dinner parties. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, what I am saying is outrageous. Because it's very easy to be outraged by the people got, God's got for his church. And a lot of people are. Now he loves us, fantastic. It's all a grace, just as well, because it wouldn't be any other way, would it? But the people that he loves, well, there's a tendency for people to be alienated by that. It's a problem we've got. It's not a new problem, but it's a current problem. And to some degree or another, it needs to be addressed in each subsequent generation. And we're looking at a series on real reasons that people resist the idea of coming to Christ. And we've looked at two already, the two big reasons they find in God himself that they don't want to come and follow Christ. The first of those, they don't feel safe to trust him. And the second thing, the first thing they don't feel safe to trust him, and the second thing, they don't want to change. And it's obvious that knowing him is going to change us. So those are the reasons, two big reasons people find to object to God himself for not coming to Christ. And those things are big important issues because they relate, of course, to repentance and faith and therefore they're not only common but they're fundamental to salvation. So there's the first part of our series, reasons in God himself that people don't want to follow Christ, that he, he, um, he's asking for change and he's asking for trust. But then you go and you look at the objections people have to follow in Christ because of the people that Christ has got with him, his church. And there are things about us as a church that people in our contemporary world find stops and want to follow Jesus. Am I making sense in English? Now I've got through having tripped up over, not starting the tape or anything. There's reasons about God. It's hard to trust him. And he's asking for faith. It's hard to change and he's asking for change. Three things then that they object to the church about which will hinder people from following Jesus. Firstly, you want me to follow Christ with you, but you're homophobic. Secondly, you want me to follow Christ with you, but you're always asking for money. That's a common one. Thirdly, you want me to follow Christ with you, but you're not nice to know whether you're boring, or whether you're funny, daddy, or old-fashioned, or whether you're just nasty when we come along. 
certainly for the people I mean, the young people I mean, the people all around that I mean. Those are three big things we need to know how to address and be aware of and ensure we're addressing in the life of any church that takes the Great Commission seriously. So today we're looking at the really fairly recent but now terribly common indeed reservation that people truly hold, which asserts that Christians are nasty to homosexuals. Now, because of the way things are in our society, that becomes really quite important. We've got to examine ourselves on this issue of how we respond to people with same-sex attraction, but never at the cost of denying what God says about things in the Bible. I'm assuming the Bible is our ultimate authority in matters of faith and conduct. I'm assuming that because it was, it was the ultimate authority in matters of faith and conduct for Jesus and for all his first followers, and here we are calling ourselves Christians. Um, so that's what I'm assuming. But what has the Bible actually then got to say? First about homosexuality, then about homosexuals, and then about how we as Christians should treat people in general, but certainly you present to us in that way. What's the Bible got on homosexuality? Uh, we've got a fair idea what school's got on it. We've got a fair idea what the world around us has got on it. What's the Bible got on it? As far as I've ever understood it, the Bible is absolutely plain, clear and unabashed, as we saw in our reading, about the wrongness of engaging in homosexual activity, homosexual acts. Not the inadvisability of it, not the inutility of this for society, but the wrongness of it. And I, as far as I can remember, I've never heard a sermon about it. But wherever I've been, Bible-believing Christians have just been adamant this is a thing that shouldn't be done, biblically, because it's wrong. Shut the door. Bosh! And that's what's causing the problem. And from time to time I've had, very infrequently, but I've had to work this stuff through with friends and fellow believers for whom it's been an issue. Sometimes with people who experience same-sex attraction and, and either they're happy with it or they're really not happy with it. Sometimes with their ex-partners, would you believe. Uh, that's a difficult one. That's really difficult to work through. Uh, sometimes with their parents. It's still on an ongoing basis. How do you do that? And it can be very, very challenging indeed. It really cuts deep. But I've always come at this from the position that however kind and caring want to be towards any given individual, there are serious biblical issues with condoning the practice. But whilst there are serious biblical issues with condoning the practice, there are also at least as serious errors involved in condemning, alienating and excluding people who ought to be trying to bring to Christ. Does that make sense? If I've been balanced, you can throw rocks at me. That's, no, you can have rocks. But, but, rock cakes maybe. Um, but, uh, and that's where we need to be. And that's hard. The mistake I've made, of course, can you see the mistake I've made? The big, big, big whopping mistake I've made in the middle of all this already? You see it yet? Can you see it yet? Some Christians are gay. Some Christians are gay. Because there's always this assumption that homosexuality exists outside the church. And same, let's say same-sex attraction exists outside the church, and it doesn't. It exists just like anything else that doesn't conform to the gospel of grace right here. Same-sex attraction exists, though not necessarily homosexual activity exists, within the church. Just as hypocrisy does, and lying does. And cheating does, and stealing does, and Phariseeism does, sometimes sadly adultery does too. Lots of things do. I'm not going to come to the end of that list, am I? And like all of those things, some or other of which we can or get up to, it is still my conviction. Scripture teaches that those things are wrong, and homosexual acts are wrong. They're wrong. But how do you encourage people to come to Christ? Whatever it is we've got with us as baggage coming along. <clears throat> There's more, of course. For example, it is not biblically acceptable to say, I was made this way if you're a thief. It's not biblically acceptable to say, I was made this way if you're a tax dodger. No, ta what do I mean? I'm going to be careful about tax, haven't we? There's one word that's right and there's one word that's wrong, is it? Uh, avoidance and evasion, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, there are all these different patterns of rebellion against God that have become a deeply rooted aspect of every human being's nature. But we do seem to treat homosexual orientation very differently from, say, avarice or greed. 
and the passage we read didn't. So here's my initial point, and it needs to be clear before we ever get to discuss any of the rest of it. This is not the only sin in the Bible. And we all have our weaknesses and temptations, and we don't necessarily, not even usually, get healed, delivered, or relieved of them at the church door. Neither as an entry requirement, nor by a miraculous means as we receive Christ. I did know a guy once who said to me, you know, I became a Christian and I was with a, with a wife in the pub that week. And I, I had my pot in front, in front of me, my pint glass, he was drinking too much. My pint glass in front of me on the table, and I looked at it and I just didn't want it ever, any, ever again. I didn't want it any more than I ever have. That's unusual, isn't it? We come to Christ with the stuff we've got, and we have to deal with it on from there. And we in this small congregation, I am sure, are wrestling with all sorts of temptations and all sorts of sins. I, I disagree with this banner and the photo only slightly. That says some Christians are gay, get over it. And I want to say some Christians are gay, let's get on with it. Does that make sense? Get on with the biblical task, yeah, of bearing one another's burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ. Well, I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to that later. So here's the passage. In this present evil age, Paul's very clear about it. We're bound to be a community of forgiven people wrestling in the light of his grace by the power of his spirit to deal with all manner of things that God says are not ideal in his people. We just don't know if we've got people here wrestling with this one because it's something you can't talk about. As evangelicals, we're not doing well at welcoming homosexuals and that's what this sermon is about and it's tricky to avoid appearing harsh and loving and welcoming because whilst very few bank robbers would expect me to say it's okay to rob banks or very few paedophiles would expect me to say it's okay to hit on 10 year old girls very few people with same sex attraction will tolerate even a raised eyebrow at their lifestyle and choices even this week, a preacher in this country was arrested for doing just that, for calling homosexual practice a sin. It was reported in the Daily Telegraph, but I only got it in my Twitter feed because I don't like the Daily Telegraph. It's a very hot potato then. So look, <clears throat> Paul is talking about all these different things here in 1 Corinthians 6. And he's saying it's eternal life that's at stake. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he's got a list of things. A balanced list. But he's saying these things are actually wrong guys. You won't get into the kingdom of God if you're continuing in theft, greed, drunkenness, slandering, swindling. You won't inherit the kingdom of God. That's what some of you were. But actually, there's the sexually immoral in there as well. And idolaters in with it. And adulterers and men who have sex with men. Whether it's sexual immorality, that is not using sex as God intended and spells out that we should and glory in it in Genesis 2.24. Or whether it's all these other things, these other things, things of all sorts that characterise the lives of those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And it's continuing in those activities that is the issue. Notice verse 12, it, it's the rebelliousness of it all that's highlighted. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to... Do we hear that? Do we do that? When we're challenged about our wrongs, we tend to assert our rights, don't we? Have you notice that? We're challenged about our wrongs and we assert our rights. Paul's picked up on that, and he's writing about 55 AD, as far as I can work out. It's not an easy thing. The emphasis there, then, is on all manner of sinners being redeemable. By his power God raised the Lord from the dead and he'll raise us also. There's future hope. And then he says free from sexual immorality. It is an issue. It is something you commit in your body. Other stuff's outside. <coughs> Whoever sins sexually sins against his own body and don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you. So this is actually desecration of the temple of God. Whatever it is not just that one thing we're talking about today. So there is, there is room there for somebody who sees what we're saying, sees what we're about, but is very, very much unwilling to give up on their uh, activity arising out of homosexual orientation. Very unwilling to give up on it. And those are the things that we do believe. Except 
Very often it's the way we express that, isn't it? What has the Bible got on homosexuality? There's the big question. What the Bible's got on homosexuality is a positive plan for the outworking of human sexuality, a glorious plan, one that we should make an awful lot more of and more of the glories of, which is for exclusive, lifelong, sexual but primarily covenant relationship between one man and one woman, it's a glorious thing. It's a glorious way that God has put in place to deal with human loneliness and isolation and alienation. It starts right back at the beginning. It's taken for granted right back there in Genesis chapter 2. So everything that's said subsequent to that in Scripture takes that for granted to start with. That God's plan for people together in lifelong covenant sexual union is a man and a woman exclusively. So, if that's what the Bible's got on homosexuality, and there's a lot more that could be said, did you notice? What's the Bible got on homosexuals? You need to be careful because you've made a category of people already. As if we made a little ghetto to put people into. It's them. And what we've got to be dealing with all the time is uh, sinners, us. Does that make sense? What we've done in the church is we've established that putting temptation of whatever sort into action is wrong. And we've established that same-sex attraction is identified biblically as a sin amongst others if it is allowed to get past temptation and into your life. But unless you were in a group or on a particular sort of addiction program, you wouldn't walk into the room and say, Hi, my name's Fred and I'm a car thief. Would you? You wouldn't identify yourself like that. You wouldn't walk into a room and say, Hi, my name's Fred and I'm a bank robber, or a liar, or a cheat, or an adulterer, or a fraudster. Could somebody else think of some respectable sin, because I'm struggling for one for the minute. Think of something respectable for me. So why do we push homosexual people into a ghetto that makes people who experience same-sex attraction define themselves completely according to their orientation? Better to define ourselves biblically as sin as all. In need of the love and the grace and the mercy of God, we learn to live like it looks like we mean it. Because that's what Paul's doing in 1 Corinthians 6, isn't it? He sings all these things. And such was some of you that you were washed, you were sanctified. The Bible says all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace, by the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. And there's the welcome. There's the welcome to follow Jesus. And Paul is absolutely specific about that when he writes that horribly messy church in Corinth. It was a messy church. The Bible's got messy church in it, but it's not to do with colouring at the back on a Sunday. It, it's to do with the chaos that was welcomed into the church so that people's lives could be exposed to the gospel and exposed to his grace and transformed into something altogether more glorious. How about this? Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. None of these things will enter the kingdom of God. Verse 11, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All that mess, whatever it was, that you brought with you, there it was. See, a Christian is a person with a glorious future, right? A Christian is a person who will tell you they've got a glorious future, but they'll also tell you they've got an inglorious past. And they might be honest enough to tell you they've got a present experience of the battle that goes on between the two. Yeah? In the words of the title of Arthur Matthews, excellent old little book, if you ever see it in a second-hand shop, Arthur Matthews, the Christian is a person who is, quote, born for battle. That's where we are. Every single one of us. And we need to be clear about that. We're not here in this world to model society on a set of Christian moral guidelines. We are here to call all mankind everywhere to lifelong repentance and faith and to working on it. Because there's only one real thing we all need to repent of, and that's worshipping created things rather than the creator God who's above all forever praised, as Paul puts it in Romans 1. And homosexual practices are identified there in Romans 1 as part of that. The effect of God giving people over to the consequence of abandoning worshipping him as the creator God. Above all, forever praise. So, so, so look, what's the Bible got on people who are of that orientation, of, of same-sex orientation? Here's what it's got. Come and join the revolution with us. 
and we're all working on that together. Because God's got a future for us far better than what God the moment. Okay, so what's the Bible got on homosexuality? I was as quick as I could be. What's the Bible got on homosexuals? I've been really quick. What's the Bible got on how to treat people? Because that's what this objection comes down to, you know? This objection that says, you want me to follow Christ when you're a homophobic. What it comes down to is actually how we're treating people as sinners like us. Although maybe in different ways. How are we to treat people from every lifestyle and background who are calling in God's name? being called in God's name by us to follow Jesus. But, you know, we've had some interesting people come in over the years while we've been here. We've had some even more interesting people in other places before we came here. How do we deal with that? <clears throat> How do we treat people as evangelicals? Well, so much of what, where we as evangelicals wrong foot ourselves on this issue it comes down to the way we feel to treat, treat people. Paul is a glorying over those people. 1 Corinthians 6. Did you notice? Such were some of you, but you were washed. <laughs> you know, can you see it just in his mind as he writes and shouts out what he wants written now? Just going through the people who walked through the door in Corinth. And being transformed by the grace of God. Is, is, he, is he pointing a finger at anybody? He's, he's not. He's glorying in those people. He's rejoicing over those people. And what God has done for them and in them. And we wrong foot ourselves on this issue. So much of it comes down to the way we feel free to treat people. And maybe that's down to our failure to appreciate the seriousness of our own sin. Maybe. Just imagine this with a minute. Imagine an unmarried couple who are living together and sexually active come along with the other huge crowds, of course, that are thronging into our church on a Sunday morning. Right? They come along, they'll be noticed. They're visitors right away. And you know they're visitors. We live in a small town. You know they're not living together. They're not married, but you know they're living together. And we're chatting over coffee after church, and they tell you they aren't Christians yet, but they're interested in God, and they're checking out our church, and they seem to like it. Who couldn't? It's lovely. And they keep coming back, you know. They turn up again, and suddenly they're there again, and again, pretty regular. And of course, everyone's happy to see them there, and they become part of the crowd, don't they? Yeah? We all get prayed, and they get converted. But we know they're living together. And you see them discreetly showing their affection by holding hands in church. Maybe they walk away from church afterwards with their arm around one another. What if the gay couple did the same thing? Mm. I don't know how happy I am with that question. How happy are you with that question? Ooh. Hang on, preacher. What are you saying? I'd love to know what Paul would do. I'd like to get his advice on situations like that because I, I can't but think in the next 10 years, we might be having to answer that question on the day. We've got to think about it. Don't get alarmed about the question, but I'm not saying I condone everything people who come to church get up to, even publicly, whether here or after they leave. But that's the sort of challenge we're heading towards. We're going there fast. So we need some answers to some pertinent questions. Because the history of the new truth of the gospel in our land is scattered with examples of Christians being challenged by social change, pulling up the drawbridge, locking themselves away from things that make them feel uncomfortable and not getting out into it with the gospel. Does that make sense? What's a gospel response? So, uh, now I've disturbed you with that scenario of the people who turn up on Sunday. How, how would you answer these questions? How are these two couples different in Jesus' eyes? They're all sinning against their bodies. And in the language of 1 Corinthians 6, what we've been looking at. Theologically, what is the difference between the straight couple and the homosexual couple? H how would your reaction to those two couples differ? I know how mine would, am I right? H how would your church want, how would our church want to react? I guess all of us care about how we, as the church here, present Jesus to the homosexual community, to our culture at large. But there are some key realisations we need to get a firm grip of, especially those of us who are over 25, because let's bear in mind there's a generational split here. Very much so. Our kids, anyone under 25, has grown up going through school, being taught very different things about these issues than perhaps we recognise or have realised. 
And certainly amongst young people, I find this objection to Christianity all the time. Most church leaders in the UK are old, and serve the old, and think old. I'm open to that criticism. It's out of touch with this changing situation that's changing so rapidly around us. And also, we grew up in a generation when it was okay for preachers, when their argument was weak, to shout loud. Do you know that has the opposite effect on, on postmodern people? It's not good in this situation. An article I read preparing for today, which I was helped by but did not entirely go along with, says this. Today the conversation is going way beyond just heter heterosexual sex and marriage. As homosexuality is being accepted as normal in our culture, I think, says this guy, many Christian leaders aren't in tune with that. So we either ignore it or just slam it down without any heart or thought. And people notice this. Not just homosexuals, but heterosexuals also have negative perceptions about the church's treatment of gays. So how does the Bible say we ought to be treating people? Here we go, it's challenging stuff. The Bible says, show all men proper respect. Show proper respect to everyone, 1 Peter 2.17. Love the family of believers, fear God, honour the emperor. 1 Peter 3 goes on, Peter's big on this. 1 Peter 3, 14 to 16. But even if you should suffer what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. How have we done on that? How have we done on that? Keeping a clear conscience, well, we've got to do that as well. So that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. How, how are we going to do that in this context? <coughs> Here's the problem. If people have got this objection to Jesus, it's because perhaps we're not treating them right. Show proper respect. How does the Bible say we should treat people? Remember the obligation to love. Now, I come from a generation where if an obviously gay couple, an obviously guy, gay guy turns up, I step back. I, I was brought up like that. That's the way I was brought up, and I went through boarding school. But remember the Sermon on the Mount, you know, that sort of fairly fundamental thing Jesus had to say once upon a time? You've heard it said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. I'll tell you about your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It's a tremendous sense in the evangelical world at the moment that we are being persecuted by, I don't know, the likes of Stonewall and militant gay rights lobby and all the rest of the world, but we are. Come back to the fundamental of the Lord's Prayer. I wasn't going to do that. I was going to major on this. Give me a sec. <laughs> because here is the foundational statement of what our, I'm looking for the word now. Manifesto should be. Even if they hate you, Jesus is saying, love that. And consistently in the things that I've read, people have been coming up against this. Guys who are, gay, girls who are uh, same-sex attracted, come into church and they... They're fine until it becomes, and then there's a hostility. We've got to somehow get over that without feeling insecure about it. Mike, what do you want to say about the Lord's Prayer? Yes, again. Part of it, um, forgive us our debtors. As we, you know, forgive us our debts yeah. as same as we forgive our debtors. And homosexuality, things like that, that's all against. The Lord is against us, and mm -hmm. um, should we not forgive them in the same way as the Lord has forgiven us? Well, anything that we, anything they do to us, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's not for us to judge in any shape or form. Now I've got you, I think. Yeah. Tell me if I haven't. But what we're saying is we have a sense of our own sin, our own dependence on the yeah. grace of God. Yeah. And in a situation where we ourselves have been forgiven, <coughs> we are not the people to condemn other people. Sure. It's, it's like the theological version of those who live in glass houses shouldn't. Yes, yeah. we should still show them love, exactly. respect, as we say. Yeah. Yeah. How should, how, what does the Bible say on how we should treat people? We should show them proper respect. We should remember the obligation to love. But the big old thing is prioritising fulfilling the Great Commission, isn't it? Um, Jesus said to them, "All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me." In Matthew twenty-eight eighteen, 
Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, to the end of the age. Now if you're going to fulfill the Great Commission, you can't do that if you're shouting at somebody. You can't do that if you're laying into somebody, if you're attacking somebody. And that's something we perhaps, there are, there are, you know, those of us, and perhaps all of us at some stage, need to relearn. The objective in this relationship, interaction, conversation, the big plan is that the Church of God and the people of God following Jesus should be out there doing what he did. And what he was doing was taking all sorts of people and trying to get them to a point where they could begin to follow him, become disciples of Jesus. Reach out to all, disciples of all peoples, <coughs> it says. Disciples of all, make disciples of all peoples, teaching on the big master plan. Here's how we go about it. Here's how we go about it. The subject of the Great Commission, all people, and that's why you end up with a church like the Ligurish All Sorts they had in the Church of Corinth. <laughs> Isn't that marvellous? It'd be great, wouldn't it? All people, a feature that gets easily lost. But do you remember what we were saying last time about not kicking the crutches straight out from somebody who's broken their leg and telling them to walk? Do you remember that? Jesus says here, teaching them progressively. Teaching them progressively to obey everything that I've commanded you. And that's so very important. It's the big plan of salvation being heard and taught that strengthens people to the point where they can be happily and gloriously progressively weaned of our sin. Isn't it? It's time we drew some conclusions because time will have got us. The problem we're up against then looks like this. We have prioritised morality, not salvation. We've been concerned with issues in society, not the preaching of the kingdom of God. We've tackled a spiritual challenge as if it were a social issue. Politicking, campaigning, using carnal methods, not the biblical weapons of our battles, which are spiritual ones, and which the Bible describes as mighty through God. Mighty through God. And in making that mistake, we've alienated and we've demonised a particular class of sinners as if we were any better. That's your point again. And the effect of that has been that we must face and live down justifiable criticism because of the way we've treated people. Because the approach we've taken has failed to honour God just because we've not said about things God's way. We've been trying to set up a godly commonwealth instead of building the kingdom of God. Make disciples of all peoples. Does that make sense? And nowhere is that clearer in the current situation than over the issue of homosexual practice. Why is it that Paul can write to the church in Corinth, and such were some of you? It wouldn't be as easy to write that to the church in Tandelo. Because <laughs> we're all great, we're all respectable, aren't we? Yeah. Thank you, Caleb, yes. <laughs> and enthusiastic and sincere yes from the back. It was the response we make on this, in fact, any other moral issue must be to welcome sinners. It's not a matter of condoning, reinforcing, unrepented sin and sinning. So there you go, Jesus is about to walk in the room. Right? Some inside excitement and enthusiasm. And then he comes with his girl on his arm, and many outside observers could well be justified to ask, well, what is he doing with her? So that's and that's grace, isn't it? And oh yes, we have received grace. And we receive grace day by day by day by day. But our calling in this world is not just to receive it, but to reflect it. And to welcome and make disciples of Jesus out of all sorts. All sorts. And that's actually what we're for. Tempted to say, Lord have mercy. Because <laughs> there are all sorts all around us. And it's going to take it out of us to do what he says.
I've had to read quite a lot this week and think quite a lot and study quite a lot for that. And I'm kind of clear about a lot of inadequacies in what we've said. But what I've tried to do is to stand back and look at the actual, the large picture. And I think what it strikes me that where this one is concerned, you know, we, we overcome this obstacle. One day at a time, one person at a time, one step at a time, by actually living through the principles that grace will teach us, you know, right from the very start. And let's be under no illusions, it's a big objection that we really do have to deal with in our society. And it's helpful. Amen.